Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Not sure. Is that on? It doesn't sound like it this morning. It is? Okay, good, good. Well, again, good morning. It's good to be here this morning. This is the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. It's also, of course, the last Sunday and the last day of the month of July. So now, during August, we're finishing out a sort of a chapter in our history together. Um, August is the last month that I'll be serving as I have been serving as interim. That doesn't mean that when September comes, I'll disappear, but it means that uh, things will change. And uh, one of the big changes is that uh, Pastor Kim will then be serving as pastor of St. Paul's, as well as Crystal Luther, sharing between the two of us, Pastor Kim Hinfer. And uh, I'll be assisting him. And so you'll still see me around some, maybe not as much as I have been, but I'll still be around. I wrote about that in the September newsletter, so when you get that, uh, you can read more of my thoughts about that. It's been a wonderful time here, and I've really appreciated the people and the place. So thank you for the ministry together. Some things to uh, remind you about, and one of those is the fact that on Tuesday night, there is an opportunity to have a pasta meal and to hear about the youth mission trip. So we hope that you can be a part of that and uh, come and hear about all those exciting things that happen for the young people from our congregation in their travels. And uh, then also wanted to uh, remind you in regard to what I said before, uh, that you can start marking your calendar for our worship service time change when September comes. We're going to experiment with some things during the three months of the fall, September, October, November. And in September, our worship service will be moving later to 1030. And uh, so uh, if you come at 9, uh, you'll just have to hang around for a while. <laughs> but um, don't be fooled. Uh, that time change happens when, when September rolls around. Are there other things we ought to mention this morning before we begin our worship time together? If not, let's uh, focus our hearts and our thoughts for worship as we hear the bell this morning. find the order for confession and forgiveness on a card inside the back cover. We'll use the side that says A this morning and I'll invite you to stand. And we begin then in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors and ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways.
Brothers and sisters, the sweet good news of the gospel is that in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority and at his command, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And our first hymn together today is a great old Welsh Presbyterian hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory, let's sing. Wisdom, all that is done under heaven. 
It is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. I saw the deeds that are done under the sun and see all is vanity and a chasing after wind. I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me. And who knows whether they will be wise or foolish? Yet they will be master for all of all for which I toil and use my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes what was toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun? For all their days are full of pain, and their work is vexation. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This also is vanity. This is our reading. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is taken from Psalm 49. We will read it responsibly as printed in your bulletin. Hear this, all you peoples. Give ear, all you who dwell in the world. You of high degree and low, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and my heart shall meditate on understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb, and set forth my riddle upon the heart. Why should I be afraid in evil days, when the wickedness of those at my heels surround me? The wickedness of those who put their trust in their own prowess and boast of their great riches. One can never redeem another or give to God the ransom for another's life. The ransom of life is so great that there will never be enough to pay it. In order to live forever and ever and never see the grave. For we see that the wise die also, like the dull ones see that they perish and you leave their wealth to those their graves shall be their homes forever, their dwelling places from generation to generation, though they have named lands after themselves. Even though honor they cannot live forever, they are like the beasts that perish. Glory to you, O Lord. 
Here Jesus hears in a request from someone in the crowd a reflection of some greed, and he warns about that with a parable. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God then said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Then you may be seated. that we use on a Sunday morning are used across a large, large part of the church. We all read the same things. And the selection begins with the gospel. And then the Old Testament and the psalm are chosen to reflect on the gospel reading. And sometimes there's more than one kind of theme in the gospel. So there are often alternative readings. And today, I just was struck by the alternative first reading, and uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece where the prophet Hosea is comparing the relationship of God to the people of Israel with the relationship between a parent and a child. Excuse me, and uh, most of us know that even in the times when children are being misbehaved, Parents still love them and still care for them. And that's the image here. Listen to this beautiful piece from Hosea chapter 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities, it consumes their oracle priests and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. For the Most High they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Zion? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zebulun? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord, who roars like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, says the Lord. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you, and that's what we're talking about, grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
all the years that I was pastor at Faith in Columbus, had the opportunity and a great blessing to be friends with many, many pastors who served other churches in the community, driving one day to a youth retreat, thinking about that, I guess, because of our youth here at St. Paul's, was driving to a youth retreat in Chicago with John Hobbins, who was the pastor at the time of the Columbus United Methodist Church. And we were talking back and forth on the drive, and suddenly he turned to me, this United Methodist pastor, and he said, I wish more Methodists understood what Martin Luther meant when he said, peccata fortitiere. <clears throat> now, Lutheran pastors know a lot of Luther quotes. <laughs> Just ask anybody who's heard me preach. And we all know most of his ma major theological tenets by their Latin titles because, well, Luther changed worship from Latin into German, but he wrote theology in Latin. I'm even going to use one of those Latin phrases today. The pastor John caught me off guard. He was referring to something very famous that Luther said in a letter that he wrote to a fellow reformer, Philip Melanchthon. Something that I know very well, but I'd never heard that particular one in Latin before for some reason. And so, what was it that Luther said that Pastor John wished that Methodists understood that? What Luther said was, sin boldly. Sin boldly. Now that's easy to misunderstand. And it sure has been misunderstood. The great Christian writer C.S. Lewis, you know C.S. Lewis, some of his great writings, he once called it a monstrous theology. And Roman Catholic detractors of Luther, well, you can just imagine what they did with that whole time. But it's important to hear what goes with it. Here's what Luther wrote to Melanchthon. Luther said this. If you are a preacher of grace, then preach a true and not a fictitious grace. God does not save people who are only fictitious sinners. Be a sinner and sin boldly, but believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly. For he is victorious over sin, death, and the world. So here is the Latin phrase from Luther that I said I would quote today. It's at the heart and center of how Lutherans understand the Christian faith. Dear to the hearts of those who speak Lutheranese, mostly because they've been to the seminary. Simul justus et peccator, simultaneously justified and a sinner, is the phrase from Luther. It's how Lutherans think about grace. We are always and forever, at the same time, falling down and still loved and cared for by God. Like that image from Hosea that we read just a couple of minutes ago. Israel runs away from me, but I can't give up on them. I'm God. I'm the Holy One. I will come to them in grace and love. Simultaneously, simultaneously justified and yet a sinner. That's what makes grace the one note we sing over and over in the choir called the church. It's the sweetest word we know, and it's the theology we cling to. We're saved by grace, saved by grace, saved by grace. We don't deserve it, we didn't earn it, we didn't pay for it, but we have it as a gift. Methodists talk about sort of a three-tiered grace. First of all, they say there's God's what they call prevenient grace. Grace that seeks us out before we're even aware of it. And Lutherans say, amen, preach it, brother. Before we even are aware of it, God reaches out to us with his grace and love. 
And then Methodists talk about God's justifying grace that gives us a sudden sense of forgiveness that sets us free as we claim it for ourselves. And Luther would say, amen, preach it, brother. And then Methodists talk about God's sanctifying grace that empowers us to be out about the work of God's kingdom. And Lutherans get really nervous, really nervous. Lutherans sometimes are accused by other Christians of being so riveted to the person and the work of Jesus Christ that we sometimes shortchange the Father and don't pay enough attention to creation and issues like stewardship of the environment. Methodists do a lot of that. And also shortchange the Holy Spirit some other Christians say that Lutherans get so stuck on justification, on how we're sinners, but God comes to us with his grace and makes us into saints that we never get to sanctification. How do you live after that? Huh? You see, the worry for Lutherans is this. When we look at our own good works, it's so incredibly easy take our eyes off of Jesus and put them on ourselves. That was the very first sin. That's what the serpent said to Adam and Eve. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And the first commandment is still the most difficult one to keep. You shall have no other gods. You know, it's often the seemingly good things that tempt us more than the obviously evil things. To be like God, wouldn't that be a good thing? Whether it comes in one big bite, like the serpent promised Adam and Eve, just take a bite of that apple and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Or if it's a gradual progression by growth, towards what the Methodists call entire sanctification. I can get to where my whole being is in tune with God's will. Now there are people who are wonderfully good people, who do great things for others, that are much in harmony with what we have in mind when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. And we ought to be among those people. We should. But Christians aren't the only ones doing wonderfully good things. Jews do them. Muslims do them. Even atheists do them. <clears throat> the people in the early Christian church used to run across people in the Roman Empire who were pagans, but they were so virtuous. They lived, lived such great lives. Early Christians called them the virtuous pagans. <clears throat> Mother Teresa, who de dedicated her life to the poor, and Jeffrey Dahmer, who they say had a conversion in prison, stand on the same footing before God. Now we want to be Mother Teresa, don't confuse me here. <clears throat> we believe in pleasing God, but not because we're trying to earn our salvation. It seems to Lutherans that often Christians will speak about faith as if the purpose of Jesus' coming was to give us another chance to be righteous. The Jews knew perfectly well the meaning of grace. That reading from Hosea we just shared is full of grace. The Old Testament is full of second chances. How many times did Moses say to God, I know that these Israelites are stubborn and stiff-necked people, but give them another chance. And God did. Second and third 
and 70 times 7 chances. <clears throat> if when you boil it all down, what Christians are saying is that Jesus' death gives us a second chance to get it right, then we've insulted Christ and made his death empty and pointless. The question I always ask myself when I think about grace is this. What is different about the situation of the people of God after Jesus the Savior than the situation of the people of God after Moses the lawgiver? Once Moses had brought the commandments, the people of God knew what righteous living was, knew what it took. So what's different after Jesus? Or when thinking about what the gospel, the good news really is, I like the question my brother Glenn, who's also a Lutheran pastor, says. Did Jesus really have to die for this? Whenever you're thinking about something about how the Christian faith works, that's the question. Did Jesus really have to die for this? And if the answer isn't absolutely, then maybe we haven't yet gotten to just how amazing grace really is. We were like those stubborn and uh, disobedient children that the God that the reading from Hosea talks about. Always disobeying, always running away, always getting in trouble, but their parents still love them and do for them. Here's a story I really like that I think helps to understand grace in the way that Lutherans understand grace. I'm a kind of a baseball fan. I'm not the world's greatest baseball fan, but I love the game. And in the year 1995, Major League Baseball players went on strike. Anybody remember that? Most of the season, there were none of the regular professional players playing for any of the teams in Major League Baseball. They all went out on strike that year. And Major League Baseball didn't shut down. But what they did is invite non-professional players to play for the Yankees and the Pirates and the Cubs and the Twins and the Brewers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I love about that story is the grace that those amateur ball players were experiencing in that situation. Just because the professionals had locked out and these amateurs had a chance to play in the big show, as they call it, didn't make them any better baseball players than they were before that. They had received grace. They were still second-rate baseball players. It was a situation in which they knew that nothing about themselves got them playing in the big show. Their being there was a complete gift. And precisely that truth was the sheer joy. It was a great year to watch baseball. It was not a joke on those amateur players. They were in on the joke. They were part of the joke. They were sim simultaneously average Joes and major league baseball players. <laughs> Lutheran theology says that grace is not a possession of the people of God, but a position of the people of God that we find ourselves in. Like those baseball players. They didn't have it in themselves to be playing for the Yankees and the Cubs and the Brewers. But there they were. Grace, the holiness of the church, then is a position, not a possession. So one last question. Does that mean that as Lutherans understand it, God's grace 
doesn't make any difference in living our lives, doesn't do anything to us, or well, doesn't mean that at all. Let's go back to those baseball players. It was just exactly knowing that they weren't professionals, that they didn't deserve to be there, that motivated them to play with joy and abandon. And there's seldom been a major league baseball season that was so much fun. Giving themselves over into a wholeheartedly, being in on the joke, and entirely unable to keep from rejoicing over the pure ironic absurdity of that amazing turn of events. In fact, others may have been better ball players, but knowing that they, but knowing that had nothing to do with where they were, then they were free to throw and hit and run and not worry about being judged. That's us. That's grace. Simul Eustace and Peccator simultaneously justified and sinned. Why sin boldly? Not because we want to or won't struggle against it, because, but because we know that it's not possible not to sin as human beings. But because we know that things are different for the people of God after our Savior Jesus than after the lawgiver Moses. And we believe and rejoice that Christ has chosen us of all people and brought us into the big show of all things and given us victory over sin, death, and the world. Salvation is by grace. Salvation is by grace. Salvation is by grace. And so may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.
Let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. O oh God, you are wholeness. Where there is division in your church, bring reconciliation and healing. Guide the work of theologians, Sunday school teachers, seminary professors, and all who provide instruction for the building up of your church. Merciful God, this is our prayer. O oh God, you are the source of all life. Where creation cries out of distress, bring relief and renewal. Bless farmers, ranchers, distributors, and all who provide our food. Nourish the land and all its inhabitants. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O oh God, you are wisdom. Where nations and communities yearn for peace, bring justice. Strengthen those who toil for the welfare of others especially military personnel, police, first responders, and activists, and for the healing of the nations. Merciful God, we receive our prayer. O oh God, you are life. Where your people are overwhelmed with the busyness of life, bring encouragement. Accompany all who experience emotional, mental, or physical distress. Renew us at your table of mercy. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O oh God, you are our treasure. Where scarcity and anxiety pervade your church, bring abundance and vitality. Guide the work of church councils and committees and give them clarity for the work of ministry in this place. Merciful God, Receive our prayer. Oh God. <laughs> oh God, you are resurrection. We give you thanks for all your saints. Inspire us by their example of faithful living to set our minds on things above and to be rich in love toward you. Merciful God. Receive, our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. One place in the Gospels, Jesus says, if you come to the temple to bring your offering and you realize on the way that you have something uh, between you and your brother, First be reconciled with your brother, then bring your offering. Which is why, before we receive our offering, we share the peace. So brothers and sisters, the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. And let's greet one another.
Once again, as we prepare to come to the table, we'll be receiving communion today by intention, so that as you extend your hand, I'll place the bread in your hand, and you may dip it into the wine that's in the cup. And uh, as you come forward, um, some may wish to, to uh, come just for a blessing. It doesn't happen very much here, but occasionally people do that. And they fold their arms. But if your hands are extended, then you'll receive the breath. And you may give it into the wine. So I invite you to join me then in the great Thanksgiving. Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right. Our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God to our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
Syracuse rise. Body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you into eternal life. Peace be with you. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the closing hymn is number 583. And uh, we know this hymn. We've known it for a long time. It's a hymn by a, a British woman, Frances Habergall, poet and hymn writer. But we don't know it so much to this tune. If you look, you'll see that the tune is by a man named William Dexheimer Ferris. He's an ELCA pastor, and he's a chaplain at Fairview Hospital in Minneapolis. But uh, he's a great lover of Hispanic music, and so he wrote this tune for this hymn.